So who really runs government where you live? Well, if you're willing to dig a little deeper, look close, and do your own research, you can probably find out. And I have an example here just from the city of SeaTac in Washington State. Now, I recently posted an article on my website at wethegovern.com, and I encourage you to go read this article because it's full of links to source documents and backup evidence that support the basic outline of the story, which delves into just one little city in Washington state and how a small cadre of kind of political insiders build their grift-making machine and they seek control of the local political levers of power and money, of course. So typically, local residents are not aware, and these are stories that the traditional media really no longer reports. Now, the point of this video isn't so much the story that I wrote, which you can read down below. Uh, I've linked to it down there. But I want to discuss the story so that it might encourage you to look closer at your city and county government and better understand who's running the show where you live. Odds are, if you haven't done this before, you might be surprised at what you'll find. Unfortunately, this probably won't be a pleasant surprise. These types of stories rarely are. But even if it is unpleasant, it's important for you to know the truth. I also think that it's worthwhile to expose the truth so that others might know. And if possible, when you see the self-dealing, grant grifting, and kind of basic insider deals that result from this type of thing, maybe, just maybe, you can inspire some change. Now, by the way, I want to discuss change in this context because I believe it isn't about my team good and your team bad. It, it really is more about exposing the truth that reveals the structural problems and the concealment of insider deals like these and undue influence operations, not just so you can replace the bad guys with your own set of bad guys. No, that's really not what I'm talking about here, nor is that really a great objective. Instead, I believe these stories are worth exposing so that we can change the local structure to make local government less attractive to these types of people and their kind of grifting games that they play when they get in charge. If we make it harder to do this, then we will have better local government, less costly local government, and hopefully more honest local government. Now, in the article that I recently published about the city of SeaTac, I point out how one political consulting group essentially controls or is taking steps to completely control all levers of political power in one little city. Now, in this case, I discuss how John Weibel with Wind Power Strategies is personally involved in doing just this. And it's more than just helping win elections. That's his job. But it is also about controlling the people that you get elected so that they can help direct the tax resources of the city to you and your friends. Now, again, I believe that this is a far bigger story than just one consulting kind of grifting operation in one little city. I believe that stories like this are actually endless, and they're probably happening where you live right now as well. And it really doesn't matter if you're in a Republican county or an area that's controlled by Democrats or, God help you, if you're in a place that's socialist like downtown Seattle or Portland control. Now, based on my observation, the socialists and the Democrats, they play this game far more effectively than Republicans. But in the end, power, money, and control tend to be strong drivers on the road to kind of local corruption. And we should all want to reduce this type of corruption as much as possible. Now, we probably can't entirely stop it from happening, but we can reduce it. And the corruption and self-dealing might look different where you live, but if you do your research, you will find it. In my article, I explain how John Weibel's organization has the city mayor on its payroll and how it has the local legislator, Mia Gregerson, on the payroll at times, and then how John Weibel even suddenly became part owner in all three of Mia Gregerson's homes, according to King County property records, which I also helped expose a few years ago with some public disclosure complaints filed against Representative Gregerson for her failure to properly report information on her financial affairs reports, misuse of surplus funds, and of course, other legal problems in the recent past. Now, my article also illustrates the incestuous and kind of weird relations between candidates trying to remove anyone not in the kind of kickback club and often replace them with newly arrived people who can be counted on to toe the line and who will owe this insider crew for their very political position. In this case, uh, this is actually done with campaign contributions, of course, but also using insider spouses as treasurers and appointments for selected insider positions regarding basically regardless of their experience or skills. And they put them on high profile board appointments, then which in turn enhance the electability of unknown newbies who just showed up in town. Now, I think the article speaks for itself, but it has been my experience I almost guarantee that you're going to find similar situations where you live if you look. 
and you should start looking, and I'd start looking right now. Now, why do people do this? And the answer really is obvious, and it becomes more obvious the deeper you look. And it usually has to do with money, of course. <laughs> taxpayer money, to be specific, because it's far easier to grift taxpayer cash for yourself, your friends, and your causes, because essentially nobody's looking. And when I say nobody, I actually mean nobody at all. Sure, theoretically, the Washington State Auditor would be auditing local governments like this, but anyone with any familiarity with how sloppy, slipshod, and kind of quiet these types of operations really are, you'll realize it's all very dishonest to call them audits in the first place. These so-called audits are actually pre-negotiated, limited reviews of very narrow aspects of local government. They negotiate the final reports with the targeted agency and elected officials so they can water down any formal findings or at least make the limited findings they accidentally discovered look like it isn't so bad. Every professional accountant or knowledgeable person that I've met in the last 10 years or so who's actually experienced one of these audits is usually so disgusted that they can't believe anyone's pretending these audits are real anymore. I mean, this is a political choice that has been made at the highest level of the Washington State Auditor's Office today. And while there are good people actually who work there, Mostly their job is to cover up whatever problems they find and make the political and senior bureaucrat class look good. Now, could the state attorney general or maybe your local prosecutor actually do something about these problems? Sure, they could, but they rarely ever do. And I mean, if they actually catch some low-level employee stealing money, they'll sometimes prosecute them with a wrist slap, or if it's too big to cover up, somebody could go to jail but it takes a lot of effort to get there. And Bob Ferguson in the AG's office, he isn't uh, directing his army of attorneys to prosecute these types of cases unless he can find a convenient Republican stealing something. So there will basically be no help there at all. Now, so realizing that nobody's looking into what happens with local government and knowing that there are few consequences, if any, even if you get caught doing something wrong, what prevents dishonest people from taking control of local government and then making sure that some of that taxpayer cash gets diverted into their own pockets or their friends' pockets. Essentially nothing, and it's happening right now. Now just look closer where you live, and you're gonna find this to be true, unfortunately. Now keep in mind, they kind of need to keep up some type of facade that the taxpayer cash getting diverted into wherever it's going is filling some type of need in the community. Remember, there's always has to be some kind of a story, and as long as the story that they push out there, um, that this story with their taxpayer-funded uh, public information officers, of course, the local media is just going to regurgitate whatever they're told, because the media doesn't really want to find anything either. Partly, this is a result of the collapse of local media everywhere, and partly this is political. Most of the journalists kind of align themselves politically with those in power, and they do this for access, they do it sometimes just out of laziness, or just because they politically agree with those in charge. So the traditional media is always reluctant to expose the truth in these types of situations. The only time I've actually seen the media wake up from a stupor is when a corrupt Republican accidentally gets in charge somewhere, and then for a few minutes, they're going to start exposing the truth. Once a corrupt Democrat or socialist gets back in, the media tends to go back to sleep. Now, where are taxpayer funds typically squandered? And uh, where are they laundered? Where are they lost? Well, grant grifting operations are actually the safest way to extract cash for yourself and your friends if you're corrupt. And it doesn't really matter the cause, the objectives, or the excuse you use to get the grant in the first place. Once you get it, the only priority of the insiders who are kind of cashing in on the grant grifting game is to make sure that they get it again next time, only hopefully with a few more zeros. I mean, all kinds of excuses can be used, like helping the homeless. And yeah, that's the current excuse that's in vogue today. And nobody wants you to ask why things keep getting worse the more cash that you squander on the grant grifters like this. However, it can be anything. It could be saving the salmon, fighting global warming, fighting obesity, doing studies, etc. I mean, really, the list is endless. And it's limited only by your imagination and willingness to lie. Keep in mind, even small jurisdictions kick out millions of dollars in grants today. Some pass through federal or state grants, but uh, some are just direct cash payouts from local taxpayer funds. Now, wait a second, you might say. Doesn't anyone check on these grant gravy trains? And the answer is no, not at all. Sure, the grant grifters themselves tell you to trust them, but their full financials are rarely disclosed, the auditors don't look, and nobody's asking anyway, so the money kind of just vanishes into wherever. 
Obviously, if you're an effective grifter, you know not to take every single penny for yourself. You have to kind of spread around to a few of your friends so that everyone's basically on the same page. You need some self-promotion out there. So you need a public affairs officer or two to make some newsletter spreads or social media posts that make it seem like you're pretending to do some good. Maybe you can get some cool photo ops and impossible to vet metrics claiming that you're actually doing some good work. But the priority once you get the cash is always to make sure that the gravy train continues to run. That's how it works. Okay, but of course, how to get the money. And um, by the way, this isn't always completely or totally illegal. It's immoral and unethical, sure. But nobody goes to jail or at least gets in trouble for doing immoral or illegal things usually or dishonest things, I should say. I mean, a quick and easy way is to pay yourself fat salaries. That's a good way to start. And if that's just too obvious, then you kind of spread your salary between multiple nonprofits so it doesn't show up as obvious on the 990s that you have to file with the IRS. Another way, of course, is to have the grant grifter kind of pay for your expenses. I mean, you won't always be able to be so obvious as some of these BLM groups who bought themselves millions of dollars in real estate, but you can cover less obvious expenses like trips to Las Vegas or extravagant leadership retreats or conventions or meals or drinks or rent or even car costs, etc. I mean, it's you're just limited really by your willingness to create justification and the willingness of your cohort to kind of all join in the fun. Now... What about the cause that you're claiming to be helping? And hey, the answer to that's actually easier. The worse the problem gets, the bigger the grants you'll get in the future. So you're only at risk of losing your grant cash if you're accidentally successful in reducing the problem. And so there's nothing more threatening to say to the homeless industrial complex than any, anything at all than actually solving the problem for which they're getting millions of dollars every year. No way, I mean, they need to show activity but nobody cares about the results. And sure, sometimes you're so bad and the policies are so worthless that even in King County, they kill the program. But those are just edge cases. And you just have to be not that obvious and you can coast by for many years and even decades without anyone threatening your operation. Of course, it's more than just grant grifting. It could just be direct hires in the government itself. Many local governments will hire relatives, girlfriends, political allies, and other friends of a political crew that kind of takes over. And it makes sense. I mean, easy jobs with little oversight and political connections, that's great benefits and minimal supervision. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Plus, your hours are long and easy, and as long as you feed the political machine with your contributions and your support and campaign season, you're set for life for as long as your political crew runs the show. Now, what do you do about the real work that has to be done? You hire some workers for those tasks, kind of lower level people. Meanwhile, the more you hire, the more you can kind of cement your support in the community. Now, what about paid contracts? Now, this is where government pays for services, and there is money to be made here as well if you know what you're doing. Many of these contracts are actually political in nature as well. Your campaign contributors might own or manage that company that provides you the consulting that you supposedly need or the training or the landscape services or the wide range of other services the government oftentimes pays for. As long as they aren't a kind of total screw-ups and they become too obvious, you can often overpay for inferior services and guarantee some helpful donors to your political campaign or kind of your get-out-the-vote effort next time around. And this is how it works. And you can't be naive enough to believe that it doesn't happen. If you have a decently organized crew in your local government, they're going to keep that grift down to kind of a minor level and provide the services the community expects to get. And even if they're inefficient and marginally competent, people will be kind of satisfied with it. But it is shocking how bad it has to actually get before people are willing to wake up. So what do these political crews of insiders actually fear? I mean, what really concerns them and kind of keeps them up at night? It's people who are willing to expose the truth and share that truth far and wide. This is why censorship is such a high priority for government today. It's not because they care about misinformation. I mean, heck, they spread misinformation on a regular basis daily. They probably every day they go to work and uh, when they're actually working. And no, they don't want to be able to suppress any public exposure about their activities and their incestuous ways of influencing the money train that's directed to their friends and themselves. Of course they do. They don't worry about the, tradi- the traditional media that we think of because political insiders know those, those guys are going to pretty much always look the other way. Nope, what they actually fear 
And what they fear the most is that you and I and others who are starting to kind of wake up to the problems and we're willing to expose and confront it, it's not because we want our share of the gravy train, but because we know it's wrong and shouldn't be happening in the first place. And that's what they fear. Because if enough people realize the emperor has no clothes, then this whole house of cards comes crashing down. And they know this, and they do fear that type of an outcome. The question, of course, is always, how do you start and expose the truth where you live? You have to build a team of motivated, skilled kind of renegades who can't be bought by the political class, and you start to do your research. Get the record requests filed for the expenses over the years. Look at the contracts, the graphs, and the players. Identify who these people are and whether they're doing what they pretend or claim that they're doing. Along the way, you're going to recruit whistleblowers who can help you save time and identify the problems. Create a method to widely and quickly communicate your, to your community basically what you find. Expose source documents and verify the facts. Provide it for the people who are looking. Ask the tough questions. You have to do background checks sometimes or property checks and verify everything that you find. You won't get every question answered, but you will be surprised about how far you can get if you're actually willing to look and do the work. What you don't want to do is don't expect like this two-hour Sunday afternoon special solution to everything that you uncover. Nothing's going to be that easy. Nothing goes that quickly, and your idea of justice may have to be moderated. And I say this because hundreds of times I've had activists ask me why this politician or that bureaucrat doesn't go to jail. Well, don't expect that type of justice because political insiders, they protect their own. Every now and then, of course, you might find it. And generally, though, that I find to be the exception. For now, you got to start with exposing the truth, though. And let's just get the truth out there far and wide. Uh, create your own teams and treat it like a regular part of your life, comparing notes with other researchers, sharing record requests, and making progress at kind of putting together your local investigations. My article on the city of SeaTac is just the start of what will probably become a series, but it's just a start explaining who is who and who controls what. However, as I dig deeper and you dig deeper where you live, many things tend to become obvious and we can find some common solutions that I believe we will need to start planning to implement in the near future. And I say this because the political process is just not static. Change often comes and when it does, rarely is anyone prepared, but you should prepare where you live. I tend to believe that freedom and liberty are only available, uh, they're only able to survive when government's actually constrained and limited in its ability to take away both. I mean, most, uh, basically most of us, I think, lose just a little slice of freedom and liberty with every new tax increase or expansion of the administrative state. We're going to have to be prepared with practical, not perfect, but practical downsizing or right-sizing of local, state, and obviously federal government we just have to do this. And this is best done as part of a first principles review of the priorities of government and what you can eliminate today without impacting what should be the true priorities of government. Now, listen, you won't ever completely eliminate corruption. As long as people are not angels, there will always be some type of corruption. But you can greatly reduce the volume, the scope, and the impact that that corruption has on our daily lives. But I believe that we only get there if we start doing the work today and planning for the future. Too many times I've actually witnessed good people, even reformers, get elected to office. And without some good plans in place, they kind of either flounder on the resistance and the distraction of the bureaucracy and those who kind of want the gravy train to continue, or they just go along with the flow. So start paying attention, do the hard work to research the truth, and start communicating that truth far and wide. But you can only do this if you're willing to show up. And we can only have an impact if we're willing to show up. Because, in the end, the future will only belong to those who show up. Mm -hmm.